It's like one of the things I tell people is to share their pain. And I tell them that not because it's a slogan. I say it because that's what I've done my whole life. I've shared my pain. Sometimes you have to be a little bit crazy to live your greatest life. I think it's crazy to live someone else's life. And he said to me, do you want to know why you admire them so much? I'm like, no, tell me. He's like, because what is in them is also in you. And I never forgot that. I never forgot that. Today's guest is the host of the heartwarming and truly profound series, The Kindness Diaries. It's an adventure series where our guest takes on these cross country adventures with no money, no plans, and he has to rely 100% on the generosity of the strangers he meets along the way. But this podcast isn't just a conversation about kindness. It's an open and it's a very real talk about the man behind the series. What pushed him to walk away from his job in finance? What kept him going when it looked like the series would never take off? And ultimately, how to find that inner kindness for ourselves and not just others. You have to hear this story. So please help me welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast, Leon Logothetis. Where I want to start is, uh, you know, you've, 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 you've made yourself the kindness guy. You have put on that mantle. And of course, it wasn't always your focus. Uh, you know, anyone who knows your story knows that, that you know, when you were younger, uh, that maybe you, know, you were bullied, you speak about the fact that you were lonely, that this teacher came in and, and really spoke kindness into your life and changed your life. And then you went off into finance. <laughs> So where, where I want to start actually is, is when you talk about the fact that you were bullied as a kid, when you talk about the fact that at this moment, this teacher came into your life and, and really showed you what kindness was, you don't really go into what that was about. What was happening back then? Yeah. I mean, look, you know, I, I grew up um, in a, you know, very privileged family. Uh, so on the outside, we had everything you could want, really. Uh, but on the inside, I just felt very alone. Um, I didn't feel seen. Mm. Uh, I didn't feel seen at home. I didn't feel seen um, at school. And it just all took its toll, right? Um, and and I, tell, I tell people that uh, often we wear a mask, um, and that's really as an adult, right? We're wearing a mask. Mm. But sometimes as a kid, we wear a mask too, mm. where we pretend everything's okay and we don't feel safe enough to share anything with anyone. Mm. Um, and that was what was happening. I, I was wearing that mask for many, many years. I can, I can identify with that so much. I, I grew up in a very... From, to the age of seven, it was the most idyllic home ever. And then my mom remarried and it became the least idyllic home ever. And I can remember in grade eight, getting off the bus, thinking I'd rather ride the bus than go home. Uh, thinking I'd rather be at school than go home. And, and so I would actually stop riding the bus because it would take longer to walk. And, and that would save me from having to get home. So the reason why I was asking about that is just like such, an, such a formative time, I would say. And the more that I looked into you, um, the more curious I was about, about that time, because, you know, you also talk about going into the family business and going to finance, uh, was finance the family business. And that was the thing that you felt pulled towards. And what, how did you end up there? Yeah. I mean, the, the family business was, uh, I'm of Greek descent. So the family business was shipping. Mm. Um, and you know, we'd done that for generations and I kind of felt that that was, where I was supposed to end up uh, in that world, in that world of shipping, in that world of finance. Um, and it really was never something I wanted to do. I never wanted to do that. The thought of sitting behind a desk was not fun for me. Um, I wanted to have adventures. I wanted to go out into the world. I wanted to meet people. I wanted to be inspired. I wanted to inspire. Uh, and for me, I never thought that I could do that from sitting behind a desk. Hmm. So you had that you had that within you, like as far back as you can think. This 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 want, this desire to see the world, to see adventure, to meet people, to connect, to do all those things. A hundred percent. I remember when I was a kid, I would swim and I would pretend that I was like swimming for buried treasure and all this kind of craziness, right? This like um, imagine imagination that I had, uh, and that imagination never imagined 
sitting behind a desk. Hmm. And so I, I guess, I guess, how did you find yourself there? Right. How did you find yourself? Cause I, some part of you must have wanted it or, or did you literally just go along with the flow? Cause, cause you built, you went through school, you, you had a job, you had career, you had success. I mean, did, was it like, um, gosh, what's that song where there's like, this is not my house. This is not my wife. Like, was there a moment of like, what the hell did I allow to happen? Or just this, or did you want it? And then one day you just didn't anymore. But the truth is I never really wanted it. Mm. I never wanted to be in that world. Mm. Um, I tried my best to stay away from that world for as long as possible. And then it became Doing inevitable. What? what do you mean? Doing, what, what were you doing? To, to- well, you know, I went to college. Mm. I, you know, I was supposed to, I remember this, in, I was supposed to start work and I, and I went on the trip. And I said to them, well, you know, I need to find myself a little bit before I, before I start. And I couldn't put it off anymore. So uh, I just, see, it was like, uh, help me, help me. And, uh, but I couldn't find the help that I needed or the strength or the courage or the bravery that I needed not to do it until I did, right? Until I found that courage to not do it. Yeah. And what was that? moment that breaking point like you know you talk about the 30 floors up the rain hitting the window type thing is this the drudgery of your life is this what you're going to do is this i I mean i felt that i think we've all felt that was there a low point a breaking point like something must have been the 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 straw that broke the camel's back i mean look the straw that broke the camel's back was really kind of like the tipping point right it had been happening even before it started right (laughs) based on what i just said um but the moment that was the tipping point was watching the documentary the movie the uh motorcycle Motorcycle diaries yeah because you know it was a romanticized version of che Guevara traveling around south america relying on kindness um but it touched me in such a profound way it kind of showed me that there was another way to be another way to live. And after watching that movie, I was like, I just can't, I can't do this anymore. That's so I amazing. have to change the way I'm living. Because if I don't change the way I'm living, I'm going to wake up at 65, having wasted my entire life, living someone else's dream, living someone else's life. And I cannot, and I will not do that. So interesting because, you know, I, 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 of course, do research and I write notes. And one of the questions I ask myself is whether the finance version of you is the real, was the real you, and you are doing this to try and break out, or if this adventurous version of you was the real you and you were caged yeah. that entire I, time. Yeah, I will tell you the finance version of me was not the real me. <laughs> I can assure you of that. Why do we let ourselves, why do we put ourselves in these situations? I've had the same experience where I built an, or a company. I'm an entrepreneur. I built a company. I worked for 10 years to turn it into what I thought I wanted. And then one day I realized that I've just built myself a cage, that, it, that it's not what I want. It's not, it's not actually what I wanted. Maybe 10 years ago, version of me wanted it. But I just, I don't know why we allow this to happen to ourselves. I think because we uh, get caught up in what society wants of us. We get caught up in what we think will make other people happy. We get caught up in making, you know, non-courageous acts. And we just get caught up day in, day out. And it keeps on happening to us. And we just get, you know, the the analogy of the frog. We don't realize we're being boiled. Mm. But if you throw the frog into the the boiling water, he'll immediately jump out. Like if I threw you now back into your old life, you'd jump out immediately. But 10 years ago, you were just being boiled. Slowly, slowly yeah. boiled. And it's it's yeah. so funny because last week, actually, someone from my past, from a very long time ago, reached back out to me. And, and I got like immediate, like my core got anxiety and uncomfortable and I couldn't figure out why. And it was because I felt like I was being pulled back to this thing that I didn't want, this version of me I didn't want anymore. Um, I mean, is there any point where you look back at that old, do you even recognize that old version of you? You know, there were times when I still get pulled back. 
Um, mm. It wasn't like I quit my job and everything just was roses. It doesn't work that, like that. You know that as well as I do. Uh, so there are times when I get pulled back to that world and it's deeply painful. Uh, it's deeply painful because it's, again, kind of giving up your own authenticity to make other people happy. And uh, yeah, there's nothing wrong with making other people happy, right? But to a certain degree, if all you're doing is making them happy and you're unhappy, then you can't do that anymore. There's, there, there comes a breaking point where you're going to have a meltdown. And uh, that, is, uh, that, is, that, is, uh, that is a tough one for anyone to have to deal with. Yeah. So, so, uh, I mean, your, your first series, uh, and I may not have the dates right, but your first series came out in 2006, I think. So when, when would this moment, this transformative moment have happened for you? Um, it happened in about 2005, uh, 2005. the moment with the motorcycle diaries, when I decided that this had to end yeah. was a, a 2005 moment. And, it takes a while to, you know, create a show and get oh, it of course, all, yeah. and all that. Um, but it's been 15 years and it hasn't all been plain sailing. Like I said, like you'll see a Netflix show, you'll see books, you'll see speeches and that's great. And I, I don't take any of that for granted. Uh, but what you don't see is what happens behind the camera. What you don't see is what happens, you know, on a day you wake up and you don't want to get out of bed. Uh, these kind of things, truth, reality that affects all of us at times. Hmm. So The Kindness Diaries was obviously, you mentioned a, a huge kind of transformative thing that happened to you. Can you go ahead and just explain to me what that is to you, what that means to you? What that- yeah, so basically I, I took a vintage yellow motorbike and I drove it from LA all the way around Earth back to LA, uh, relying entirely on the kinds of strangers. I had no money, no food, no gas, no place to stay. And I couldn't accept money. All I could accept is the exchange of goodness, the exchange of heart-centeredness, uh, the exchange of kindness. Um, and then I did, and the twist was that unsuspecting good Samaritans received the life-changing gift. So if you helped me, we helped you. And I also ended up doing it in, uh, from Alaska to Argentina, but this time with a 50-year-old beetle. Hmm. And so what was that life-changing gift that you would, that you would bestow upon these people? It, it, it depended on, on each person. But for example, one of the, the people we met was a homeless chap who I ended up sleeping on the streets of Pittsburgh with. Mm-hmm. And the next morning we were able to put him up in an apartment and send him back to school. So these, these kind of things. I, I, I love that so much. And, and, I, and I did hear that story. So you were in Pittsburgh and you're, you know, you, you, you need you need gasoline. You can't accept money, but you need you need someone to pay for gas. You need someone to pay for uh, food. You need someone to pay for all these things to help you out every step along the way. And and no one would step up and and do that other than this 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 homeless chap. Yeah, basically, I, I needed a place to stay, uh, so I went up to him. I had no idea he was homeless. He didn't look homeless, and uh, we started chatting. And I said, "Can I stay in your house tonight?" And he goes, "I'm really sorry, I'm homeless." Uh, So I was about to walk off, but he said, but you know what? If you want, you can stay with me tonight. I'll feed you, I'll protect you, and I'll give you some clothes. And that, that, I mean, you know, that's that's a whole story in itself, but that was a life-changing moment for sure. Can I share with you something that I don't think I've ever talked publicly about? So about two years ago, I was getting off the side of the, the motorway, and there was someone stopped at the side of the road. And so I pulled up and I asked if they needed help because I don't I just always do. And they said, yeah, yeah, I'm out of gasoline. Um, I'm, I'm not local and I don't have my wallet. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll take you to the gas station and I'll pay for some gas for you. So I did that. And then they kind of gave me this story about how they were, you know, they were struggling and this and that. And could they help them? And, uh, you know, they gave me their phone number and they gave me, uh, they, they gave me uh, all this collateral and, and I went to the bank machine and I got out some money for them. I got out, I think a thousand dollars. And we agreed that in two days we would reconnect to exchange that money back and that they just needed a short-term loan. And every step along the way, I was thinking, this is like too crazy to be a scam. You know, there's, there's security cameras everywhere. I have his contact. Like, it's just, it's just too bizarre. And so I said, I'm going to help you out with this. It was a total scam. It was, it was a total scam. I lost, I lost a thousand dollars. I felt taken advantage of. I felt foolish. I'm a smart guy. It was ridiculous. I went to the police. They didn't believe me. They said, no one's what you just gave a random person a thousand dollars. And I was, and 
so my takeaway was like, well, it was a thousand dollars worth well spent because I'm not going to let that happen to me again. And I'm not going to let someone take advantage of me. And maybe next time it would be more, but I I've just been so embarrassed and I've never been able to shake off this, like that, you know, me helping people. Um, I felt so foolish for doing it. And so I can understand why some people may not help you when you're going around. Yeah. Uh, but, and, and there's no need, truly no need to feel foolish. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've done that before. I remember there was a Ugandan fellow that contacted me. I ended up giving him like $500. And then he kept on going to other friends and asking them for money. And I realized I'd just been scammed. Mm. But, you know, that's all right. It's fine. You learn. You live and you learn, right? How do you shake that off without that affecting your opinion? You know, when, when Pittsburgh won't help you, but a homeless man will, when people turn their back on you, when people scam you, how do you not let that bleed into like your, your, your kindness coefficient or whatever it is? Because you'll always find that one person. As long as you keep on going, you will always find that one person. And just because there are 25 people that are mean to you doesn't mean that the 26 won't be kind to you. You, you have seen great success and you may not be anywhere close to where you want to be, but, but I mean, you've, you've done some pretty remarkable things. And so I know that for myself, when I'm down, because I have really up days and I have really down days, when, I, when I'm down, if I try to get onto my soapbox, I feel like a hypocrite. I feel like I'm preaching. I feel like it's that I'm saying it, but I know deep down inside that I don't actually live up to the very advice that I'm giving. Yeah. And that really, that really bothers me. So there'll be periods where I go dark for like three or four months because I just can't bring myself to lie. Mm. And then there's other times where I'm up and I'm confident and I'm, and I'm just like, come on, we can do this. This is so great. All you got to do are these things. And so I, I was looking at your career and going, man, you've dedicated yourself to this for so long. There's got to be times where it feels inauthentic, where it feels preachy because it happens to us all. But in those moments, what do you do to remind yourself or to get back aligned or, or to make sure that it's not just this persona you're putting on, but it's really authentic to you? Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, I woke up today, not in a particularly good place. Hmm. Um, and I was thinking just that. I was like, I'm about to, to do this, this uh, um, podcast and I have to be happy Leon. Kindness Diaries, Leon. The kindness guy, right? You're not uh, with me, man. <laughs> well, yeah. And uh, on some level, that is part of who I am. But on some level, it also isn't. Like, you know, the inability to get out of bed at times is not what the kindness guy would do. But mm. it is also what the kindness guy would do because he is just like you. And he has meltdowns. And he has moments. And... Uh, so to answer your question, I think sometimes it is a help to be able to get out of bed, right? To be like, oh, okay, I've got this podcast. I've got to show up. Yes, I've got to show up with, with, with joy, with happiness, but also I've got to show up as, as the tr real authentic Leon. Mm -hmm. um, and that is what I'm trying to do. Uh, I, and it helps me to get out of that mode of being like, oh, you know, I don't want to get out of bed. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not like putting on a persona. It's like stepping into my real self. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. 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 So it, it, because it's funny over the summer. I, so I, I, I changed my sleep schedule because I got lazy. Um, I let my diet slip a little bit here. I'm still working out, but I didn't realize in January, I snapped everything back. It's like getting back up at, I'm getting up before five or four 30. Uh, I'm working out every day. I'm really strict on my diet. I like, I just shifted a few little things and suddenly it's like, Oh yeah. I remember this guy. I used to be, I remember this, this energy I used to have these things I used to have. Um, and so you talk about the boiling frog. Uh, you know, I've heard people talk about just one degree, right? Like you're one degree off today, but way down the road, you're going to be miles away from, from where you're supposed to be. Um, but I wouldn't expect of you to struggle to get out of bed. I wouldn't expect of you to have doubt. I wouldn't expect of you to have fears because you're the man who spent the last 15, 16, 17 years, you know, showing all of us what's possible. And so, you know, that must be just a huge weight on your shoulders to carry, a huge mantle to carry. 
I mean, you know, not really, because when I give my speeches, I speak my truth. Mm. When I um, sit with my therapist, I speak my truth. When I'm having a conversation with you, who's asking me, you know, tough questions, I'll speak my truth. Because if I didn't speak my truth, it would be like you would know that I was being inauthentic. The only way that I can um, follow what I share with others is to do it myself. Mm. And yes, there were good days, but there were also bad days. And that's okay. It's okay for you to have a, a breakdown. It's okay for me to have a breakdown. It's also okay to go out and share as much goodness as we can with the world whilst having a breakdown, right? It's, a, it's all right. It's like one of the things I tell people is to share their pain. Um, and I tell them that not because it's a slogan. I say it because that's what I've done my whole life. I've shared my pain. And without sharing our pain, we get consumed. And if we get consumed by that pain, it will ultimately destroy us. So I do my best to share it as, as best as I can, right, with, with safe people. Um, and having the ability to come onto a podcast and really be real is a beautiful thing. And sometimes people don't want you to be real, right? They want like the happiness and this and that, but clearly that's not what you want. You want the truth. So you're going to get the truth. I love it. And, you know, uh, often I think of the cost of things, you know, I'm, I'm a risk adverse person. So the thought of doing what you've done, you know, like, Hey, let's grab a, a, a by the way, my dad used to have a, a, an old VW beetle. He had a 74, uh, a 74 convertible beetle. And that was his very first car. And I think it even may have been yellow. I don't know what year car you had, but <laughs> 71. Oh, 71, three years in advance. Uh, but, you know, the, the, I'm risk adverse. And so I always think, well, what would this cost me? What would be, tr what would, being truthful. You know, this person who's asking me, how are you doing, Mark? What, what will it cost me if I tell them the truth? Or this, this, per, you know, this person that wants to get together and hang out with me that I really don't actually have that much interest in, what will that cost me? Um, being authentic, being true, being honest, it feels risky. And yet you've built books and, and uh, TV shows and, and people uh, genuinely love your approach and what you do was there did this come at a cost to you i don't think it came at a cost you know uh, i've always wanted to be as authentic as i can be um that doesn't mean that i go around telling everyone how i feel right it doesn't mean i put all my pain onto people it doesn't mean i choose people to share my my issues with who are unsafe it means you have to be discerning about what you share and who you share it with. Because um, I could be interviewed by a podcast host who clearly doesn't care about going deeper. And I wouldn't go here. But clearly you do. So I'm going here. But there wasn't a time where your parents, your friends, your family, the people that that thought that they knew you went, what are you doing? Like, what are you, are, are you, you know, like, and, and that's the kind of cost I'm talking about. Like, you know, you want to maybe stay close to people and you worry that you'll lose them or, you know, people just must've thought you were crazy when you decided to make the sudden change. No. Yeah, no, they did. And they still do. And that's okay. Cause I am crazy and that's fine. Sometimes you have to be a little bit crazy to live your greatest life. Um, I think it's crazy to live someone else's life. Um, so if they think it's crazy to live my life, then, then that's okay. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. So, so 2005, you, you see, uh, you see this, the documentary, you see the film, it inspires you. You decide I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to make this happen. Now, you know, people don't come along and hand out TV shows. They don't hand out book deals. Uh, they don't just, they don't just say like here, uh, you know, here's a, here's $400,000 and we're going to set you up with a production company and yeah, we'll take care of all your visas, your passports, all of your paperwork. Okay. When can we get started? And, and by the way, we've saved, you know, Tuesday night at eight o'clock for you. Like, 
like that doesn't happen. So from from what we see today, you know, Netflix specials and best selling books and documentaries and all of this stuff, that's not how it started. How did you get from the idea to actually uh, uh, putting content out there and making it happen? Because that's a that's a big, scary step for people. Yeah. So I quit my job. And I had a friend who worked in the TV industry. And I said to him, look, I want to uh, create a show where I want to walk across America, relying entirely on the kindness of strangers. Do you think we can do that? And he's like, yeah, we can do that. So we did it in a very low budget. We went and filmed it. We edited it. And no one wanted it. No. Oh, that must have been crushing. <laughs> yeah, it was. it was like, this is so depressing. What, Like, please. No one wanted it. And I found myself on uh, the internet one day uh, going onto a site called mandy.com. And it's where you can try and sell your projects. So I put my project up as like a last uh, uh, hurrah before I gave up. Um, and a distribution company sent me an email and said, look, we really want your show. Let us sell it. And I was like, all right. So they tried to sell it and they ended up selling it to National Geographic International, which was just incredible, right? Mm. Deeply incredible. Uh, so we sold it and we ended up doing three seasons of that show, all being uh, aired on National Geographic International. Um, and it was just amazing. And after that, I thought to myself, okay, great. I've arrived, uh, but I hadn't. Um, I spent four or five more years kind of working in Hollywood as a, in a, in the production capacity, but I kept on doing things. I kept on doing my own, my own stuff. Um, and then someone, I'll tell you a funny story, actually. I was, uh, I think it was 2010. I had, I had hired, this was before Tinder. I'd hired a matchmaker and she couldn't find me anyone. And then the last session of our hold match- on, Hold on, hold on, hold on. You hire a matchmaker to find you a spouse? Uh, like a- like a Yeah, like a partner. Like someone like to share partner. your life with? <laughs> yeah. And- um, what, what was your criteria? Oh, I don't know what my criteria is. I'm <laughs> kind. Um, and I, and, and you know, we were about to go our separate ways. And she said to me, you know what? Have you ever thought about writing a book? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, well, I want to put you in touch with my publisher. I was like, all right. So she put me in touch with her publisher and I ended up writing the book, a book, Amazing Adventures of a Nobody. Now, no one read that book, which is fine, but I did it. I got it out there. Uh, lucky again, right? Um, and it wasn't until 2013 when I finally decided that I was going to follow my true passion and quit my job in the production world and, you know, start doing the kindness diaries and start doing uh, speeches. Like for example, speeches, you know, now I speak in, in, you know, I've spoken in stadiums mm. three or four or five years ago, I was going across America for free, speaking at schools, mm. speaking at businesses for free with like 10 people. I remember once I uh, arrived at this event in Chicago and not one single person showed up to hear me speak, not one. Right. And I never forgot that because when I was speaking, I, I had the good fortune of speaking at the Utah Jazz Stadium. When I was speaking at the Utah Jazz Stadium, I was thinking to myself, yes, this is amazing. Well done. Be proud. But remember the time when no one came and heard you speak. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, that's kind of, you know, just. Winston Churchill has a famous quote, I always say this, but it means so much to me, never, never, never give up. And that's kind of been the philosophy. You know, even when things aren't going well, I just keep going. Hmm. I just will never stop. So having done this for, uh, gosh, 15 years, uh, almost two decades, whatever it might be. And, and of course, you know, from the outside, it looks like this linear path. I've built enough businesses to know that every two or three years is a chunk of time. It's like, oh, that was, that was what was happening in 1617. And oh yeah, in 1819, this kind of happened. So there's these, these, these chunks of time. But with this idea of never giving up, and I'm curious, do you fall on the side of, man, I've built this thing. And so I feel obliged to keep it going, even though maybe it's not firing me up anymore. Or on the other side of, man, I just can't get enough of this because when it clicks, it feeds my soul. Both. Hmm. Like there are moments when I'm like, oh God, I don't want to do this anymore. 
Mm. And there are moments when, like I had a meeting today about a documentary we were working on, which will come out at the end of the year, uh, where I was like in the flow. And I was like, this is what I was always meant to do. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but it, it flips from one to the other at times. You can't always be in like a state of creative bliss. <laughs> That's what I'm chasing, man. I just, every day I want to be like super efficient, super happy, super productive, and nothing goes wrong, honestly. Exactly. I wish. You wish. You wish. So uh, it, if you look at through your story, dedication, hard work, perseverance, never, never, never give up. How much of this was also attributed to just luck? I mean, look, you know, had I not gone on to Mandy.com, I wouldn't have had a show. Had I not spoken to the um, matchmaker, I wouldn't have had a book. Had I not, uh, I was on Good Morning America a couple of years ago, and the, the, uh, one of the editors of Reader's Digest just happened to be watching this three-minute segment with her kids. And she called me up and said, I want to do a book. These kind of things, you know, it's it's... It's, uh, you know, people say you make your own luck, but I don't know about that. Sometimes luck just happens. It's so funny, though, because I actually believe a lot in luck, but you just gave four examples where each one of them came from you taking action. You know, Good Morning America, someone saw me. Well, you were on Good Morning America, right? That would scare the shit out of me. You know, like, <laughs> you know, you're like, hey, I, uh, I, I was with the matchmaker and it led to the book, of course, but you were taking the action step of trying to use this person to find something else. So, so you also have a tremendous amount of just like, is it, is it, I don't know if it's confidence or bravery or just your action focused, but it seems like you actually idea you're going to make it happen or you're going to do something or you're going to move in that direction. Look, there are certainly times when I do that, and that's when good things happen. And there are certainly times when I don't do that, and that's when good things don't happen. So <laughs> I think you're right. Your, your theory of, of, of luck is often because of action is, is often true. Like the person that wins a billion dollars in the lottery – was playing they won the billion dollars because they bought the lottery ticket. Right, you got it. What are the? I think our local lotto person says uh, uh, you got to be in it to win it. <laughs> yes. So, you know, we're we're having a bit of a real conversation here. Do you? How much of your time do you spend in that flow, in that action? Like, is that your more your natural state, or is your natural state struggle to get out of bed? But I have a responsibility. I have a dedication. I need to make this happen. Where's your Where's your natural state most of the time? I would say my natural state is probably not to be in that state of action, right? Mm -hmm. It's to be in that state of inaction. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes you have to force yourself out of that state of inaction. And uh, there's a very famous quote by Goethe, uh, boldness has genius, magic, and power in it, something like that. And that's, that's the truth. That, that is, the, in many ways, the definition of taking action. The moment you are bold, magical things happen. The reason I wanted to pause on that for a second is because I think those who have yet to do it, if I think back to my 20s, uh, I'm in my late 30s now, but even five years ago, I, I, I would have looked at you as superhuman, as remarkable, as someone who has something that I clearly don't have. You know, you, you have it, you've done it, I don't have it. But, but the more we speak and the more that, that, I, that I know about you, um, you're just, you're, you're like everyone else, but you've done these most, most remarkable, extraordinary things. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to pull out from you the tactic or the thing that puts you over the other side. Cause I think, I think people will look at you and think again, yeah, as you mentioned, you're happy all the time. You get up, you're kind, you know, you, you, you must over tip. You must uh, hold the door for every single person. You know, you must uh, end each email or notification without any hint of sarcasm or rudeness. Like you're just the kindest dude in the world. Right. <laughs> yeah. That would be untrue. Um, I always share with the world. If anyone wants to listen, I say there's no perfection, right? I'm not perfect. I don't do this perfectly. I'm not suggesting you go out and be kind perfectly all the time. Mandela wasn't perfect. Martin Luther King wasn't perfect. Gandhi wasn't perfect. No one is perfect. Uh, and anyone that says they are perfect is lying, right? So uh, it's not about preaching perfection. It's about preaching 
uh, commitment. It's about preaching, you know, committing to, to how you show up in the world as opposed to just, you know, following your dreams when it comes to making money or looking after your family. There's nothing wrong with that. But how many people commit to showing up um, as often as they can with goodness and kindness and love in their hearts? Not that many. And no one does it perfectly. You think Mother Teresa was perfect? Absolutely not. And you think that everyone thinks I'm perfect? Trust me, sometimes look into my email account and see how many how many messages I get from people saying, well, how dare you go around the world and, and mooch off, off, off people? How dare you uh, be so narcissistic? Whatever, you know? So you've got on one level, you've got someone saying, oh, Leon, thank you so much. Literally, the show saved my life. And you've got on another email, someone saying, you're a horrible human being, and how dare you do what you did? So, you know, it, it is what it is. People are going to project whatever they have going on inside them onto you if you go out into the world and put yourself out there. And is that just a daddy lion symptom of, like, you know, like like how, how dare you uh, – make a career off of showing like, I, I just don't understand that, I guess. Like, like who are you to have gone off and done this? You, you, you know, you're not a, what a soccer player or, or, or athlete or something. I, I don't get that, that, that response. You know um, some people think that kindness is seeing someone being kind and they look at it cynically. Like you're only being kind because uh, you want to get something out of it uh, or whatever it is. It doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. It's something that's going on inside them mm. and they're projecting it onto you. And you're never going to, I'm never going to be able to stop that. And, and what that's, do you just, do with that's just the way it is. What do you do with those emails, those messages that like that side of you, how, how do you protect yourself from that? 99% of them I just ignore, mm. but there are some that are so egregious that I will respond in a very um, calm fashion that puts them in their place and I move on. And every time I've done that, no one has ever responded to, to the message I send them because it's so like, you know, it, 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 it's so egregious what they're saying that I just, I've had enough. Like, you know how sometimes with celebrities, yeah. they will respond to someone who trolls them. Yeah. yeah, there's just that one person that's pushed them too far and they'll put them in their place with 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 class and with dignity mostly. Right. Um, and that's what I what I do. I'm just because I'm kind doesn't mean I'm going to let you walk all over me. Do you think people walked all over Muhammad Ali? No, they didn't. Was you think he a kind guy? He was pretty, pretty kind from what I've read about him. OK. I, I, I don't I don't know that much about him other than his his very aggressive nature of of psyching people out, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. So so what? I'm sure you get this all the time, and I apologize, but I have to ask. So, what you know? If you think back to 15 or 20 years ago, if you think back to even longer ago, the teacher who showed you what kindness was and what you understand about human nature and kindness today, how has that changed? Do you know, it hasn't really changed. What she showed me was that kindness is making someone feel less alone. And that's literally what I try and do. That's my definition of kindness, making someone feel less alone, making someone feel less alone, not from up here, from here. That's really what it's all about. I, love it. I just have to let that sit for a second. And so that's being seen, feeling heard, being respected. I mean, I'm kind of, I guess I'm a kind of an analytical guy because I'm trying to, I'm trying to do the very head thing that you just talked about. <laughs> maybe, maybe I don't do kindness as well as I should. There's nothing wrong with coming from here, right? Um, Joseph Campbell, the guy that wrote The Hero's Journey, said that um, uh, you have to master both worlds to live the greatest life. And he meant this world and this world. Yeah, it's a master them both. And so you've spoken about, you know, being in bed, having hard days, the ups and downs of obviously production and, and uh, celebrity and all of those things. 
Um, but you've also spoken about the fact that, you know, you get messages from people that say, I've watched your show and it saved my life. How do you know, how do you know that what you're doing actually matters? It's a great question. And I think sometimes I truly know when I receive messages like that. Um, and I receive many messages like that. And the kindness diaries wasn't just me. It was many of us that, that, that did this show. But when I receive messages from people telling me that they've been touched by what we did and that they've been inspired to see the, the goodness in humanity, that means something, right? That gives me fuel to keep on going, to keep on doing it. Mm. Because for many years I was traveling just for myself. Mm. And then one day I woke up and I said, well, what's the point of traveling if it's just for myself? I'm gonna travel and try and help other people as well. Um, and getting that recognition and affirmation that what I'm doing is helping someone is a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's like that, that connection their humanity and my humanity connect in that moment. Shared experiences, right? That's you're giving, you can't see me right now. And I apologize, but you're literally giving me goosebumps. <laughs> I'm just, that's why maybe the, uh, the, the tone of the conversation shift a little bit. I'm so, um, uh, I, I'm so inspired, not by your TV show, um, not even by, by the kindness, because I, because I'm, I'm a, I'm a marketer and I, and I went to film school and I'm a content producer. So I see it as content. I'm inspired by your bold action. I'm inspired by the fact that you decided to do something and then you committed and recommitted to it, maybe monthly, maybe yearly for all of this time. And I go, do I have this within me to do, to commit to something as much as you have? And, and that's why I've asked all these questions because really I'm just trying to say, can I be as bold or as strong as this man who's in front of me right now? Clearly you can. I'll tell you a little story. I went to India a few years back and I followed this, uh, let's call him a guru for two weeks. I had no money, no food, no computer, no phone. He took away my passport. Um, and he, uh, one day he said to me, Leon, who do you admire the most? And I told him, I told him Winston Churchill, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, um, Nelson Mandela. And he said to me, do you want to know why you admire them so much? I'm like, no, tell me. He's like, because what is in them is also in you. And I never forgot that. I never forgot that. I love it when we can have these types of raw conversations and Leon delivered. Okay, key takeaways for me. Number one, share your plans with those who will listen. Your experience, it can help others gain the courage to overcome their own struggles. Number two, good things happen when you take action. If you remain in a neutral state, you might miss a lot of opportunities that come your way. And number three, we can't perfectly display kindness, but we should all try to do our best. Kindness is making someone feel less alone. And that is a gift that you can give others. Remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show the world and we can show ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have to think big. You've got to be bold and you must say yes. If you're ready to learn how to get done, you've got to hear the conversation I had with this entrepreneur. Click on the link right over there. I did that. I submitted a hundred resumes and I got one response back. Those are like the two or five minutes a day when you're sitting there with warm waters and you're really in the moment and you're not in chaos. 